is the Gaslight Anthem with Rolling and Tumbling. It's quarter past four on Wednesday, the 11th of February. And uh, with what's going to be a rather busy few weeks and months uh, for the, the UK's politics scene, uh, we've also, of course, got to remember that there is something else that we uh, we need to be aware of in the world of government and politics and things like that. And that is the European Parliament. And today, university students here at Sunderland University have been learning uh, all about it and all about an exciting trip that's happening very shortly as well. Uh, from Elizabeth Sweeney-Smith. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello there. Thank you very much for taking time out to chat with me. Uh, you've been very busy over at North Shore today, I believe, uh, delivering um, uh, a bit of an interactive session on the European Parliament. So... Can you explain a little bit more about what you were doing here, first of all? Yeah, great. Um, I'm working for the European Parliament Information Office in London. There's also an office in Edinburgh. Um, the region is represented politically by three MEPs, uh, two Labour, Jude Curtin Darling, and Paul Brannan Labour, and Jonathan Arner, MEP for the UK Independence Party. My role as a member of staff for the European Parliament Information Office is to try and help um, people across the regions um, understand who these MEPs are, uh, what they are doing for the region and how the European Parliament interacts with the other uh, European institution, the European Commission, on how laws are made. The invitation came from the Students' Union and um, we're delighted to actually have had an interactive section, session with so many interested students from a range of different uh, departments from the university. Uh, so is it good today then to, to see that interest kind of grow in, in this session to see just so how many people and students were interested in learning about it and how it works? Well, considering it wasn't a timetabled time uh, session, I was delighted to see that there was probably about 30 students there who gave up their own time um, to come and hear um, in advance of a trip to the European Parliament in Brussels um, about how the politics actually works in terms of what MEPs do, um, where, where are they when they're not in their constituencies, what are they doing in Brussels? and also to learn about some of the other resources on websites where uh, some of them are budding journalists, they can actually find and, and make their own um, searches on resources. Now, I'm going to be very honest here. I did vote in the last uh, European election that we had, um, but I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I don't really know kind of what it is or how it affects me directly, you know, as a young person in the UK. So um, what I'd like to know is then, what is the European Parliament and, and how is it affecting me kind of right now? The European Parliament is one of the institutions, along with something called the Council of Ministers, who actually are the only two elected bodies that actually vote on legislation. A lot of the tabloids would say European bureaucrats are making our laws. In actual fact, there's three institutions that are actually involved in lawmaking. One is the European Commission, who actually drafts the legislation. They're the civil servants. And the other two elected bodies are MPs who are in governments across the EU and they're made up of, um, let's say for example, the issue was a health issue, that would be the health ministers from across 28 EU member states as they're called, and they would meet in something called the Council of Ministers. They are amending that original proposal in tandem with our elected MEPs, of which there are 73 for the UK and three for the North East, and those two bodies are the only bodies that are actually voting on the legislation. Legislation that impacts on us in terms of uh, disability rights. I don't know if any of you have noticed when you go into lifts and hotels these days, the buttons need to be low for accessibility for people in, in wheelchairs. The blind uh, need to be able to know what's on medicine packages, whether you're young or old, if you've got visual impairments, then you need to know what's in those medicines. And Braille is something that um, has to be on packets now. Erasmus Plus is a scheme that the European Union runs, essentially aimed at young people and increasing mobility for young people uh, to, to travel and integrate and learn about other countries. Lots of the things that young people take for granted these days, the ability to travel across borders without visas, is something that you know is just part of uh, the fact that we have been part of the EU for the last 40 years. So it's really interesting that the stuff you're describing there, I'm thinking, oh yes, I have noticed there's Braille on medicine packets now, I have noticed lift buttons are lower as well. Um, and you mentioned kind of the, the negative kind of stigma that the tabloids place on it, and that, you know, the, the EU bureaucrats are making all of our laws. Do you think that's part of the, the difficulty of trying to, to provide this information to people and get people to understand what it is, because it has this sort of negative press around it sometimes? I think people need to be able to learn between, uh, to read between the lines, to realise that um, journalists and uh, editorial control have their own agendas, and we need as individuals to be able to filter the news for ourselves. 
So resources such as the UK Parliament website has an awful lot of materials about EU legislation that's going through. You don't need to rely on a journalist interpretation or a headline writer uh, for this. You can actually access something called www.europarl.org.uk and that will tell you about some of the policies that the European Parliament is actually looking at that have come through and um, amending as representatives of citizens of the, of the UK. So um, we've obviously got the, the 25th, um, so that was last year, the 22nd to the 25th of May was, was the elections last year, the new MEPs have started now um, and it, 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 for me it kind of seems a bit like well how does someone from the North East affect what happens in Europe, um, so ha kind of ha what's that process once the person is elected? What happens then? Where do they go, and what do they do? Well, the, the North East uh, sent three representatives uh, over to the European Parliament in Brussels. Um, as I say, two Labour MEPs, Paul Brannan and Jude Curtin Darling, and a UK Independence Party member, Jonathan Arner. These are brand new MEPs. Um, Lib Dems and Labour and Conservatives were the three representatives during the last five years. So these MEPs, their responsibility is to uh, represent all of the constituents across the North East. The North East is a, is a small region if you compare it to somewhere like the South East, where there's 10 MEPs, but the, the actual scale is, is much, much larger. Um, the number of MEPs for the UK is 73 compares to 650 MPs, so often the visibility of MEPs is less, primarily because they cover a larger area, but also because they actually based in, um, well, they're based in their constituencies, but they actually have to travel to Brussels and Strasbourg an awful lot. This week, the MEPs, the three MEPs for the North East, will be representing the interests of people from Sunderland, for example, um, in the European Parliament in Strasbourg, where there's a full parliamentary session on. There's lots of other um, NGOs, non-governmental organisations, Age UK, animal welfare interests. These are all lobbyists that are all circulating around uh, the EU institution decision makers in terms of having an influence on what is impacting on those sort of uh, interest groups, um, not only in the North East, but across the UK as a whole. And like you say as well, you know, these are decisions that are actively having and making a difference in the country as well. So it's important that we do support our MEPs when, when they are going over to Brussels and to Strasbourg and, and taking part in these sessions. Yeah, definitely, in terms of uh, they need to listen to constituents, and constituents need to be led uh, by the MEPs uh, for their region. MEPs from this North East region would be sitting in their affiliated political groups in, um, in their sister organisations in the European Parliament. So all the 73 MEPs do not sit together. They would sit, Labour would sit with something called the European Socialist Alliance, the Lib Dems, uh, there's only one in the UK now, uh, would sit with the Alliance of Liberals and the UK Independence Party sit with a group called European uh, Free, uh, 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 Director of Freedom and Direct Democracy Group. Uh, so they're lobbying and they're interacting with their counterparts across the EU. Wonderful. Uh, and we're now joined as well uh, by one of the students who we mentioned earlier who were going on the, uh, the trip to Brussels. Um, what's your name, first of all? Um, Victoria. Hello, Victoria. <laughs> Hello. Um, you were at the session today, then. Yes, yes. Uh, what indeed. were you hoping to get out of the session today, first of all? Well, I think we'll learn a lot about Parliament today. Um, I probably heard things that I probably haven't heard before. And um, probably I had a different view um, and had quite a good look how the parliament works and um, um, what kind of you know once you see the building you can well you say right that's a building that's a nice building and yeah. um, that's a parliament probably but then um, we got so much information about what actually is happening in that building um, and everything so I'm really grateful I think everyone's grateful for all the information we got today so you said you've learned something new there did you ever kind of actively seek out information about well, the European not parliament? really I think the main thing we learned today was um, don't believe everything that you see <laughs> um, in the news, even, you know, all the headlines or anything. Don't believe everything, every single thing. Just uh, do your own research and probably just, um, you know, have your own head <laughs> on your shoulders and don't believe everything. So that's really good. That's a really good thing, really useful. Which is the advice you're often given as a voter as well, isn't it? It's have yes. your own head, have your own opinions and, exactly. and don't kind of be, be led by yeah. what, what you're being told, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are going on the trip. Over yes, I am. I'm really parliament. excited, yeah. Are you, uh, have, are you packed yet? Not are, yet, no. Like, oh, what am I going to wear? <laughs> what, what am I going to wear in the European <laughs> Parliament? <laughs> Well, no, not really. I'm, I'm always uh, I'm that kind of person who, do, who does everything at the last minute, so <laughs> we'll see. 
we'll try and look as smart as possible. <laughs> I was going to say this actually, this the, the TV show at the moment inside the Commons, which kind of takes you inside mm. the uh, the Houses of Parliament. You see all those strange kind of traditions and rituals that go mm. on in there. Um, I, I, I'm interested to know: are there any kind of is any of that transferred over to the European Parliament? Do you have a man in a wig walking along with with a, with a ribbon, a green ribbon wrapped around the legislation? No, the, the European Parliament is a really modern Parliament, mm. A, in terms of how it works, but also B, in terms of the, the buildings. Um, the only sort of thing that you could make a parallel with would be um, the, the ushers, so the actual people that actually look after the functioning of when the Parliament is in full session. They would have the long frock coat, and they are based on the uh, French system in the, uh, the Assemblée in Paris. Uh, so it's a very modern Parliament. It's no government and there's no opposition so there's there's no bear bite bear baiting that you see in the prime minister's question time which we've had on today of course mm. um lots more women in the european parliament um so, oh, it's more of a consensual um type of parliament ra rather than the traditional that we saw in the commons last night how interesting I've, i just really wanted to know that because i'm sat there watching the tv show last night thinking really does this actually <laughs> happen but i'm glad to see that it doesn't transfer <laughs> over to the european parliament as well uh so um back to the trip then uh what are you hoping ev eventually to get out of the trip are you hoping to learn a bit more about how parliament works in Europe? um yeah that's probably the main reason why i'm going i really want to see uh well first of all i really want to see the brussels itself never been to belgium and um well, also the other reason is I really want to know how the parliament works. It's so interesting how all these different people from different countries with different languages are coming to one place uh, with headphones on and, you know, everyone's, you know, having their own interpreters and everything. Just really interesting. And, um, as, yeah, as just want to have nice pictures. Uh. Yeah, some nice pictures to put on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. I think what's most interesting about the European Parliament is kind of how you do, like you say, you have so many people coming from different countries, you know, very different kind of socioeconomic backgrounds as well. Uh, and you kind of sit there and you think, well, how does that all marry together? How does a decision ever get made when you've got so many different countries coming together? But I suppose that is something that you're going to learn, hopefully, yes, when hopefully. you're in Brussels as well. Uh, well, thank you very much.